So what I want to do now is I want to finish up uh, phylum mollusca and talk about these three classes right here real briefly. We've talked about them already and through some other assignments we learned a lot about them but uh, hopefully this will be a, a short lesson and I have actually lots of little video clips to show you about these classes. So first of all, um, class bivalvia are the mollusks with two shells. Each shell is a valve. Examples of these are, are mussels, clams, oysters, scallops, around 10,000 species. Uh, some of their main characteristics, they lack a head, uh, any kind of cephalization it's called. Uh, all their sensory organs and nerves are typically around the outer edge of the shell. So if I look at the shell right here, so around the outer edge, just on outer here, but just going on the inside where the flesh is. Uh, they're typically filter feeders. They have uh, siphons. They siphon water in, it gets filtered, and then they siphon water back out again. So this is class bivalvia, two shells, as we see here. All right, um, what else? Uh, here's some examples. This is the scallop. These are the coquina clams. Here's another scallop. What's really cool about scallops is that they have a bunch of eyes. See those little dots right there? Those are actually eye spots and eyes. So unlike most other bivalves, they do have eyes. Down here, we see the giant tridacna clams here and here. Notice these beautiful colors. This is the photosynthetic pigment of the dinoflagellates that are living inside their flesh, mutualistic symbiosis. And over here, we have an oyster right there. Uh, why do they have these siphons? Well, the, one of the reasons most of them have siphons is because they burrow down into the sediment like we see right here. So they can stick these siphons up into the water so they can get access to, to food and uh, oxygen. Uh, we've talked about this a good bit, but this is how uh, I mentioned it in a couple of the videos, how scallops can actually swim. Kind of reminds you of SpongeBob. Uh, they can pump their, their shell closed, forcing water out and through like jet propulsion, propulsion movement through the water. So... You can kind of see some examples there. Uh, here's another one, a little short, I think. This is actually a Florida scallop. So it can, it, it's got to have pretty good eyesight because it's got to be able to sense a potential predator to try to, uh, to get away from it. Um, gastropoda, these are organisms that have one shell or no shells. And this includes snails, slugs, and a special group of slugs called nudibranchs, naked bronchs, which means naked gills, because they, they, uh, their gills are exposed and just out uh, on the outside of their body. Most have a single shell, unless they're the slugs and nudibranchs. They use it for protection, and like all other mollusks, it grows with them. Uh, so I have some uh, good pictures of these here. So we see some basic gastropods. Here's one that I showed you in the last presentation, this whelk right here. Um, here's a cowrie shell and some more cowries over here. Here's a conch, and you see the organism that's up inside of there. So these all have one shell that I've showed you. And then these are the nudibranchs right here, right here, here, and they have no shell. Down here we have a triton's trumpet. And one really interesting thing about triton's trumpet is they love to eat Econoderms, sea stars. In fact, I remember one time when I was in Jamaica, we had this big tank, shallow water, about this deep, like the size of a big six foot, eight foot table. And I went out in the seagrass beds and I collected lots of organisms to put in there. So when our first visiting college group came to visit, they'd have lots of stuff to look at. So I found several sea stars, not quite like that one, uh, but just as big, cushion stars are called about that big. And then I, I found one of these. I put them in these tanks. I was so excited. And so the, the group arrived late that evening, and I, I walked them down to show them uh, the, the wet lab, we called it. And they, they looked in the tank, and all of the sea stars had a hole drilled on top of them, and the triton's trumpet had sucked out all their insides. They were all dead. So uh, I quickly uh, learned that lesson pretty quick. All right, so uh, here, here's a great video of a nudibranch. This is called a Spanish dancer. I'm only playing part of it, but you'll get the idea of why it's called a Spanish dancer. You can see it's exposed gills right there.
there. So it can actually swim through the water. It can crawl on the bottom and also swim through the water. All right, we've uh, seen this video before, so we're going to skip it. All right, the last group of the cephalopods, there's basically about 65, 70 members of this group, and we're talking about the squids, the octopus, the nautilus, and the cuttlefish. Literally, the name means head foot. Uh, they have little to no shell. The nautilus is the one big example. Their muscular foot forms the arms, tentacles, and the siphons of the organism, and they use these things also for movement, so hence it's still Sir, the foot serves the same purpose. Water can also be drawn into the siphon, and, and then water that's in the mantle cavity can be pushed out really quickly when the, the siphon contracts and use that for like jet propulsion so they can move very quickly. Uh, a few more things. They have eyes and a very complex nervous system, not found in, in, in really any other invertebrate. It's actually very comparable to our eyesight. Uh, they feed, uh, you can use their tentacles to ward off attackers. They can also use them for feeding. They have these things, chromatophores. And I'm gonna show, when we do the squid dissection, I'm gonna show you this. But these little pigments of packet, uh, little packets of pigment, there's basically three different types, three different colors. And they can uh, expand the muscles around them, allowing more of the pigment to be exposed or contract it to reduce the amount of pigment. And they can do it very quickly so they can change their colors and change their patterns really, really rapidly. They actually use this as a way to communicate to other squid and to other potential predators, like kind of warn them off, like I'm not in a good mood, leave me alone type thing. They have a sac containing sepia ink, so squid ink, octopus ink. They can shoot this ink out of the siphon, making a cloud of ink in the water, much typically much larger than they are. And that's thought to distract the, the potential predator. The predator focuses on the ink cloud and the cephalopod goes the other direction. So very uh, interesting way for, to, to, for survival. Um, they have these uh, strong tentacles with suction cups for capturing prey. And also they have a beak at the middle of their mouth, you know, around their mouth. They have these a two-part beak, very bird-like. And this is actually the only part of the cephalopod or of most cephalopods that is hard. So especially for octopus, octopus can, can pretty much squeeze through any size hole as long as it's bigger than the beak. So you could have an octopus that's maybe 10 feet across from, from tentacle tip to tentacle tip. Its head might be that big around and it can fit through an opening about the size of a dime. So that's, that's pretty amazing. This is really beneficial to them because quite often we find them living in cracks and crevices and small cake caverns you know, in the reefs. So they can get through small openings uh, to hide and they typically come out at night and stuff like that, the octopus. All right, here's some uh, some great examples. This is a squid. You can see these chromatophore, these little pockets of pigment, and they can open and close them and change them very quickly. This here is a cuttlefish, and what's interesting about a cuttlefish, this is one of the few that has a very large internal structure. So they call it a cuttle bone that runs down their body. And if you look right up here, these here are cuttle bones. There's actually a use for them. They sell them in the pet shop industry and they put them in bird cages. Maybe if you've ever had a bird, uh, you might have bought a cuddle bone. They put these in the bird cages for the birds to scrape their beaks on to keep their beak tips sharp. That's really important to birds. Uh, this is the blue ring octopus, very, very venomous. Most of the octopus have venom glands. Some of them are stronger than others. Uh, here's an octopus that's actually crawling along the bottom. This is a Humboldt squid. You see how large that is in, in reference to that car. And here's another great example of a squid. A neat thing about these squid, how they change their color, you almost see them darker on the top and lighter on the bottom. The reason for this is if there's a predator above them looking down into the, into the darker colors down deeper in the ocean, that darker top is gonna blend in. And if a predator is underneath looking up towards the sunlight, they're going to see a, the lighter side of it, helping it, again, blend in to the environment, to the ocean around it. Um, this is a Nautilus. I'm going to show you just a few seconds of this. You can actually watch it swimming. This is the one group of cephalopods that have a shell, and you see this hard shell. Coming out of the shell are these tentacles. You see the opening to the siphon, so it's pushing water out of that opening right there. You'll get another view in a second. 
uh, to move around and it has eyes on each side. So you can see the eyes really well. There's an eye right there. See the eye right there and this one on the other side. And these are all the tentacles. So it's basically swimming kind of blind because it's going backwards. You can't really see where it's going. But the idea is that typically we find these down in, in the deeper waters where there is no light. So that really doesn't matter. This is a rare thing to find them up here on a coral reef in a well-lit uh, photic zone. See an opening right there of the siphon. All right, let's keep going. Um, this is an octopus called the vampire squid, but I think it's actually an octopus uh, found in pretty deep ocean. But what's really neat about this one, uh, it has huge eyes because, it, it, again, it's found in deep water, dark water. But it can also uh, almost turn itself inside out. Let's see if we can see a little video clip of that. and turn this, the, the arms and the webbing between it kind of around its head region. I don't know if they're going to show that in this video, but it's pretty neat how they can do it. All right, keep going. Uh, here's a short video somebody took of, a, of an octopus they found on the beach, and I guess they're trying to save it, or they do save it. And in a second, you're actually going to see it ink, which is kind of neat. All right, right about now, it's getting ready to happen. There, you see the ink cloud. So it pushes it, release the ink into the mantle. That's where the gland is. And then it pushes it out through the siphon. Uh, this is a video, pretty famous, it's been around a lot on the internet, showing this uh, Pacific uh, octopus that actually so they caught somehow and it's escaping through this small opening in the side of the boat here. Not an easy organism to keep in captivity in tanks because you got to make sure they're sealed with almost no openings. Otherwise, they'll do that out of the aquarium. Here's a cuttlefish. You can watch it changing colors. And it doesn't just change colors. It, it has patterns of colors that move down the body. Look at that. Oh, amazing. Another octopus inking. So a snorkeler found it, spotted it, was filming it, got a little too close, and there. This is a blue ring octopus. This is the very venomous one. They, they actually capture prey, like fish and things, inject the venom, paralyze them, and then eat them. And this octopus isn't much bigger than a golf ball. They're very small. Oh, capture them very well. Um, let's see. Let's get that one. And here's another octopus. This one is a, the mimic octopus. Uh, it's thought to mimic several different organisms. It can run along the bottom like that, sticking its tentacles up like that. Kind of they like thought to mimic a, maybe possibly a lionfish. It's also thought to, to mimic sea snakes with the tentacles and the coloration pattern, so, so pretty neat. And this is the uh, coconut-carrying octopus. I'll show you a few seconds of this. But they actually will go out and find a, 
uh, coconut that's sunk to the bottom after it's become uh, absorbed a lot of water and sank, dense with the water, pick it up, carry it around, and actually hide underneath it for protection. There you go, look at that. So pretty smart organisms. That's one of the big things to point out about the cephalopods. They're considered very smart. And then if they find another half, they'll actually get inside of it and pull the two halves together. Uh, again, they're very smart. You put a jar with a crab inside of it in a tank with an octopus, and they will actually learn how to unscrew the jar. Not only that, if they watch you unscrew another jar outside, that'll speed up the process, and one octopus can watch another octopus unscrew a jar, and then they know how to do it. So inside of that is a hermit crab, one of the foods they like to eat, and right now they're trying to figure out how to open it. And we'll see it here in a second. And as they get closer and closer to achieving their goal, you see them start to get really excited and moving a lot faster. Oh, now we see the tentacles inside. It's got the crab. It's got the top off. And that's it. Um, how do you tell them apart? A squid, a cuttlefish, an octopus. Cuttlefish have that internal shell and they're kind of short and squat. Squid are a lot more streamlined and torpedo-like and long, uh, longer bodies. Um, they actually have a total of 10 appendages. They have eight arms and then two longer tentacles, or an octopus just has the, the eight arms. Um, and octopus have no shell. And I think that is it.